How do you know when it's the right time to pivot? You need to try and monetize your product as quickly as possible because it's extremely dangerous to give away something for free or very, very cheaply and um, have users who tell you a lot of compliments and maybe even use your product. These things uh, might uh, sort of obstruct your view and make you th think that you're more successful than you actually are. There's no quick wins. Uh, if something feels like a quick win, then um, I'm sure you'll find out that it's actually not as simple. I think now big companies are starting to um, to notice that, that it's not as simple as give ChatGPT to all uh, employees and uh, let it use it, because we know that there are some, some limitations. Piotr, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Uh, the people who are watching the YouTube version of this get treated to a beautiful view of Warsaw. <laughs> what can I say? I, mean, I actually Warsaw. thought it was like a fake Zoom background or something that he'd engineered into the platform that we use for recording podcast episodes. Such is the kind of thing that somebody with a Cambridge engineering degree could be pulling off. But yeah, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Come visit Warsaw and check it out for yourselves. Uh, it's very cloudy today, but you know, still very beautiful. Yeah, or the winter is generally kind of like dark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's not the best time to visit Poland, but uh, yeah, but uh, still, still recommend it. Nice. All right. Well, let's jump right into the technical topics that we have planned for today. So you're the co-founder and CTO of Quick Chat AI, and so this is a startup that empowers companies to build their own multilingual AI assistants. So how does it work? And yeah, how do you ensure your platform is accessible and adaptable to various business needs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so let me let me start at the beginning. Um, it's funny how uh, it's changed a lot. Um, what wording and what explanations we can use to actually explain to people what our product is. Today, everyone has talked to ChatGPT several times. So now it's really sufficient to say, You've tried ChatGPT several times, you've used it for your own purposes. And now imagine integrating ChatGPT within your product, within your company processes, such that you can have a conversation with a computer that allows you to fulfill tasks, to be more productive, to complete certain actions, and also to have uh, that system as a public facing AI assistant that external users can use for sales purposes for customer support and so on. So uh, the way we think about it is it's a platform that allows you to create conversational AI experiences exactly the way you want uh, so, so that they can serve your business, right? It's, it's no longer a toy. It's something that you can test from A to Z and really deploy with, with confidence to your users. Very cool. So how do you distinguish from other kinds of solutions like this um, particularly the at the OpenAI Dev Day recently, they announced the Assistance API. Um, mm -hmm. So, how like how does your solution fit in against you know other incumbent platforms and, and particularly that API? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so today, what we are discovering, having worked with businesses for for in, uh, for a number of years now since you know 2020 since gpt3 first came out is that um, it's a very different challenge to create a system that a business will be confident in putting front and front and center on their on their website on their on their products um, and also it's a completely different engineering task to create an ai assistant that it's very simple to set up right all the demos we can we can see on twitter this is literally telling you like it, it will take you 10 seconds to create an AI assistant, right? But the question we ask ourselves is, okay, we're going to have our customers um, use our product for a year, and then they're going to look back and see, okay, how much business value did they deliver? How happy am I about the actual, you know, detail, tiny details in the conversations that the users are having with the product? What kind of tools does, you know, QuickChat or, or their competitors give me to learn from these conversations, to improve them over time, and to you know go back to management and show that you know this product really um, en enhances our business. Um, so, so it's very much a different conversation. I feel like today a lot of developers want to make um, the setup of conversation AI products extremely simple, but then there those tools are lacking the 
um, you know, the, the little knobs you need to tune the experience to be exactly what you want. And that's really what we, what we're focusing on. So sometimes we talk about our platform as kind of like the, the Photoshop of conversational AI in a sense that we want to have it packed full of features that allow you to really dig in and become an expert in conversation design and testing and get that experience exactly what you, what you, what you need. Um, obviously, um, we're still, you know, only getting started and our roadmap is just packed full of features that will be rolling out continuously. So, so our product will be very different, you know, a year or two years from now than it, than it is now. Uh, but that's the general direction we want to, um, we want to give people, uh, the power to fully control their conversation experiences. And those conversation designers, we feel like this is going to be kind of a new profession that will start coming up, will be the people who uh, make the computers talk exactly how, how they want and, and make voice finally, voice or, or chatbots finally a, a really productive partner for you to use every day. Yep. Uh, so does that mean that it isn't just an API? Like, so I was talking about the assistance API that OpenAI now offers. So this sounds like, especially through the Photoshop analogy, it sounds like you have a user interface um, that, yeah, maybe you don't need to be a programmer to be using the quick chat, the quick chat solution. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, exactly. So, um, so our basic product that anyone can uh, just go to our website and create an account and start for free, that's, uh, that's exactly a no-code no solution that allows you to create your own AI assistant with its own uh, knowledge, integrated with your uh, favorite tools, um, like messaging apps. And also you have a wide range of settings that allow you to tweak the conversation exactly as you like. And that's, and that's a tool that's available for anyone. You don't need to be a, a, a programmer at all um, to, to use it. Um, and of course, we're talking, we are working with a number of companies that, you know, have used the tool, um, you know, used our, uh, our business setup to, um, to get it to exactly what they want. But then there were some custom features that they also uh, liked or custom setup of modules that they wanted to uh, ask to implement to really get, um, you know, get the, get the quality exactly where it needs to be or uh, implement the, the exact business um, processes that they, that they need. And there, I would say the quick chats role is not only delivering the software that allows um, people to really control the conversation, but also to teach them about the business processes that you need to take full advantage of introducing conversation AI in your, in your companies, right? So um, if you think about a, a large organization that switches to using an AI-powered customer support, putting an AI chatbot on your website as customer support is, is just the first step. You know, then you need processes to um, analyze conversations and gain, in, gain insights uh, from those. And those insights come in two uh, parts. One is uh, those insights tell you how to improve the chatbot over time, add more things to its, uh, to its knowledge base or add more capabilities, uh, more actions it can take from within the conversation. And the second one, which I, th I think is uh, really often neglected, is that those conversations that your users are having with the AI are an amazing source of business insights. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, those are the people who come to you and complain about your product or they um, explain what they would like to achieve. And in those insights are hidden ideas for your product, future product uh, features. And to be able to you know, gain those insights and analyze them at scale, that's, that's an extremely important process that companies implementing conversation AI solutions will definitely want to implement in the future. Nice. I got you. So uh, let me kind of like explain that back, that last point there. So you have an external facing chatbot powered by quick chat AI that um, like, let's say I mean, it could be my company. So my company, Nebula, um, we are a platform that is automating <laughs> as many kind of white color processes as we can, specifically like human resources things to begin with. So um, we have a platform that allows you to find talent. Um, so, uh, we could have an external facing chatbot that could be interfacing with our clients or could be, um, interfacing with the, the talent that they're trying to attract to their, uh, companies. And as those people are having these conversations, they're going to be bringing up, um, issues with the way that our product is working, <laughs> with mm -hmm. the way that the Nebula product is working. And so what you're saying is that 
uh, something that is baked in to quick chat already is that there's some way for me to be gathering the insights from those conversations. I, what, what does that look like? Like how, like, mm -hmm. so, you know, so, you know, maybe there's some, some feature in my platform that's buggy. Um, you know, somebody like a really simple example, people keep trying to, to pay, <laughs> but like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the credit card billing platform isn't working. And so like, this is like a huge problem. Like people want to be paying me, uh, and they can't be, but they're ha and they're mm -hmm. having a conversation with an automated bot trying to resolve this. How would that get flagged to me? How would I find out that I'm having this issue with credit card swipes? Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so that feature that we call conversation insights that currently isn't yet available in the in the self serve solution where you set it all up. But this is something that we make available for for uh, custom projects. And the way this would work is that, well, first of all. Um, it's important for us to understand your business, which, and, and already I have, I have some, some idea now based on your explanation. And, uh, there will usually, usually be some aspects of what the customer are, customers are talking about that would be particularly interesting for you. So for example, insights about new feature ideas and insights about some, you know, emergencies or, or big, big issues. Right. And, um, there, um, Quickjet AI will automatically sort of scan the conversations and will will and in your daily or weekly reports you will be able to be flagged with you know the most common issues and um, and th those would be sort of categorized into into some packets that you that you should uh, particularly focus on. That's the that's the basic idea of how it works. Um, and a very simple uh, example of that is our um, human handoff feature. So. Uh, the way human handoff works is that QuickJet AI automatically recognizes when uh, when the conversation is going in the direction that it will need human attention. So maybe someone wants a refund or someone just wants to talk to a human or someone keeps asking uh, similar questions over and over, which might suggest that uh, the AI is kind of confused or that it doesn't have the necessary knowledge to, to answer. And then, then our system can detect it automatically and automatically um, you know, disconnect the AI from the conversation and have one of your human agents to uh, to take over. And uh, an interesting uh, conversation conversation insight kind of feature that uh, that is being used there is that your um, one of your human agents is pinged with a s summary of the issue that the customer is is facing. Right, so there's no need to read through perhaps some cha chaotic uh, transcript, but rather you just get a nice summary and you can just act on it immediately. Grobi Optimization recently joined us to discuss how you can drive decision making, giving you the confidence to harness provably optimal decisions. Trusted by 80% of the world's leading enterprises, Grobi's cutting edge optimization solver, lightweight APIs, and flexible deployment simplify the data to decision journey. Garobi offers a wealth of resources for data scientists. Webinars like a recent one on using Garobi in Databricks, they provide hands on training, notebook examples, and an extensive online course. Visit garobi.com slash SDS for these resources and exclusive access to a competition illustrating optimization's value with prizes for top performers. That's G-U-R-O-B-I dot com slash SDS. That's very cool. That, like, when you say that out loud, it sounds so obviously to me like a super valuable solution. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, so you can be uh, gathering insights from chats in these kinds of daily or weekly reports that capture the biggest um, issues, the topics the customers are discussing most in their chats. And then in addition to that, you have a process that can flag that a human needs to be involved uh, in a conversation or, or it appears likely that a human needs to be involved in the conversation. And then you provide a summary to them. I'm guessing a lot of these features themselves are powered by generative AI. So, I mean, obviously that summary of the transcript, that's going to be, you're going to be using a generative AI model to do that. And then for the insights as well, even creating like, I don't know, obviously you, you can't go into proprietary secrets, but uh, maybe to some extent you can fill me in on how you um, categorize all of the conversations from that day or that week uh, into uh, different discrete categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, um, to think about these, these things in a way that, um, our approach always focuses on rather than 
assuming that LLMs are the solution to all of our problems, we treat LLMs as, as the language generation tool that we can use at any point, uh, at any, at any point during our processing, right? And the, the reason why this is important is that we have a lot of people mention to us things like, um, I would like to create an AI that is an expert in some subject, right? And then many people, what, what they will do is write a prompt that suggests that, okay, this AI assistant is a subject uh, in uh, geography, and then off you go, uh, go and talk to it. But the problem with a product like that is that it's, um, it's exciting to use at the very beginning, but then after you've used it for a week or two, it's becoming sort of repetitive unless you have a specific problem that keeps happening and you, and you need to keep, um, using that solution to solve it, it, it quickly becomes kind of uh, boring. So the question we usually ask these people is that, okay, first, like, where is your expertise and now explain your expertise to us. And we're going to use AI to build an experience that, that sort of packages that expertise and delivers it back to your users, right? And, uh, and it's very similar in, to, to what you just asked about, right? Which is these conversation insights, uh, we, we may try to generate them sort of um, automatically, but usually the, the USP and the, the real value is in talking to the customer and really understanding what they need and really understanding the, uh, the, 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 the details of their business. And then at the very end, using LLMs to answer those questions, solve those problems, right? So LLMs, they're not, um, at, le <laughs> at least for now, universal problem solvers that also think for you and answer the questions that you should ask yourself. But rather for now, I think um, we should know what we're looking for and use LLMs as a way to get there rather than um, just hope that it works just like that. Nice, nice. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Can you give us like a concrete example, perhaps, um, like, you know, uh, <laughs> like an example of a particular customer and mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you, you don't need to disclose who the customer is, but maybe just like their industry or something and uh, explain, uh, yeah, like kind of how you'd work with them to figure out what their big issues are and how you would uh, be able to prime their LLMs to be able to tackle these kinds of user issues. Yeah. So um, so an interesting uh, use case is um, is a market research, or or very specifically is um, is the process of having um, human agents talk to uh, customers or potential customers who have tried a particular product, and then um, trying to ask the right questions, get insights from them on how to improve the product or whether they would actually want to, uh, want to try the product. And there, there, the, uh, the tricky bit is that, um, you know, if you've just tried a new kind of cookie, then, uh, if I just ask you to describe the taste, then, you know, you would just sort of tell you what you thought, but, um, only if I'm able to guide the conversation in the right way, then maybe you will tell me that, well, actually last week you had a cookie that was a bit more crunchy. And, uh, and that will give me an insight. Okay. Maybe that, maybe that's really the reason why you're not as excited as you are. Right. And the real expertise is to teach the human agents how to, um, conduct the conversation so that, so that they can discover the, these things. Right. And, and the interesting part is that, you know, it's perfectly possible these days to set up an AI assistant, uh, with a very simple prompt that will just have a conversation that sounds very much like market research kind of thing. Um, and I'm sure that you would see the demo, you will be, you would be impressed and people would, you know, share it on Twitter and so on. But then when it comes to, you know, actually la launch it to people and then, you know, run 10,000 of these conversations, gain insights from them, you will find that they're all sort of very, very generic. They're just, you know, not, not up to scratch. And the reason is that the expert knowledge and the sort of human mm, experience that was gained, um, over, over the years in the industry was not embedded in how the conversation should be conducted. Right. And the way, the way we would approach it is we would talk to experts, um, so they can show us like, you know, several transcripts of how these conversations should look like 
try to decompose them into um, you know, particular actions taken that should be taken by the interlocutor uh, and particular context that the interlocutor has. And, and only from there to decompose the whole conversation into kind of a set of actions with particular context. And that, and that you can use as a skeleton for your, for your AI to, to run. Very cool. Yeah. And so interlocutor there just means like it could be a human agent or an AI agent that mm -hmm. is like handling the conversation on behalf of the company. Exactly. Yes. Nice. Um, okay. Yeah. That's crystal clear. And something else that you've um, talked about in previous interviews and actually our researcher Serge Massis uh, for, I already mentioned this to Piotr before we started recording, but um, many of your uh, public interviews are done in Polish. And Serge doesn't speak Polish, but he wanted to be able to have insights from those conversations. So he was using uh, the OpenAI Whisper um, algorithm uh, to convert those Polish conversations into English so that he could prepare some of these questions. And so this is an example of one of those questions. You previously contrasted light solutions versus enterprise solutions. Um, so can you like expand on these two different categories of solutions that, that a company like yours can offer? Um, yeah, so, uh, so that distinction would be what I referred to earlier as, you know, as, as our self-serve solution versus the enterprise or custom projects that we, that we develop for, for companies. Right. And, uh, we do distinguish be between those two simply because there are some companies that are perfectly happy with creating an account on our platform and sort of figuring it out for themselves and using all the different features to, to achieve exactly what they want. Um, and then there are other companies that are, that, that much prefer that all the work setting everything up is done by us. And perhaps that some of the modules that we have are slightly tweaked. So they, so they fit their use case, uh, exactly. So I think that's the, uh, that's the usual, you know, um, starter essential business and then talk to sales, um, set up where, where it's a sort of high touch, uh, integration. Very cool. So, yeah, so your tools would empower somebody with a role, like a conversation designer at a client of yours. Mm -hmm. So this, this conversation designer can use quick chat AI to be doing the kinds of fine tuning that you're describing. So it should be understanding particular issues, using historical transcripts to be, to have the right kind of flow to the conversation to be handling uh, common customer issues. So you've talked about modules a few times, including just now in the context of light solutions versus enterprise solutions. Would you be able to talk us through kind of like the key modules that Quick Chat offers and, you know, and kind of bring to life? You know, if I'm a conversation designer, let's say I'm a conversation designer at my company and I want to be using Quick Chat AI, what are kind of like the key modules that I might be using in my first week um, with quick chat AI in order to be fine tuning the conversations. Yes. So, um, when, when setting up an AI assistant, usually the first starting point is the knowledge base. So, um, you first really need to ask yourself a question of what do I want the AI assistant to know beyond the sort of general world knowledge that it, that it already has and where does my company store that information, right? Uh, it might be that it's sort of spread out across uh, your company's websites and sub pages and URLs, which so that data can be downloaded. It can be uh, PDFs. It might be that it's your FAQ pages, maybe on on intercom, maybe some other um, some other system. Um, it could be that it's that it's Word documents. So it's so it's important to. Uh, to gather all the data and and it can be uploaded into into quick chat so that that will be the first step um, and then the second um, aspect of the conversations that you that you start with is the sort of AI setup uh, that's what we call it and the very basic settings there is to decide on on the kind of tone of voice but also um, there you can go into more details you know if you're creating a an AI assistant that maybe is is uh, tuned to uh, to be selling your products, right? And then your knowledge base would be uh, filled with product descriptions uh, along with their URLs. Maybe there will be some promo codes. Uh, there is a setting that to choose that the AI assistant is more focused on providing URLs uh, and provide and and being more more uh, salesy, right? There is a setting that uh, that we're launching uh, in a few days, which we call AI profession, which which sort of gives you a basket of these behaviors all in one that you don't need to uh, 
uh, think about them separately, but but you you can choose an AI assistant that is a salesman or or an expert in something or an or an educator. And in this very simple setting, you can um, you can get this this entire basket of of solutions uh, all together. Um, and then um, and then obviously that that gets you to sort of the first stage where your AI assistant you know has the right setup, has the knowledge base, and it's possible to be for you to to start testing. Um, so to start having conversations as if this this was your uh, users and start getting insights into how well your knowledge base is being used in in conversations and um, and that's when the sort of important start uh, stuff starts because um, very often companies discover that the knowledge base that they provided to the AI is uh, incomplete or uh, in some parts uh, sort of self contradictory or uh, there are some parts that are completely missing and and there the important part is to have have the tools to be able to um, to sort of debug it right because unfortunately you know there's no there's no magic bullet uh, you know uh, gpt 3.5 gpt4 are very smart but it but they will not provide good answers if the knowledge base itself um doesn't make it clear what the what the right answer should be um so um so we do have tools that we make available for our uh, for our custom uh, projects that allow you to have conversations, debug particular messages to really understand why the particular messages message was generated and really dig into your knowledge base and find that perhaps, you know, you have two blog posts that talk about the same thing, but the, the conclusion is different, right? And until your knowledge base is really cleaned up, then, then your AI assistant will not work as well as it could. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, I can see that happening all the time where you obviously have resources that were collated over many years written by humans. Uh -huh from, yeah, they could be in the same department, but two years earlier, the platform worked in one way, and so they created the document one way, and then later, this product worked some other way that, that are directly contradicting. But mm -hmm. you're just like, oh, sweet, we've got this new conversational assistant, let's just give it all the information that we have, and mm -hmm. just throw everything in without people realizing that, like, yeah, there's these inconsistencies in guidance um, due to, yeah, you know, yeah, things changing over time or mistakes, you know, humans make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then over time, as you keep on testing and maybe you launched it to some group of users and then you're, uh, you can see some first conversations that weren't as good as you thought. That's when the really interesting uh, st stuff uh, starts to happen uh, because uh, we start to discover that actually um, it's very much subjective what the correct answer should be according to some people you know it might be that uh, an answer looks perfectly fine to one person but actually someone else will say that you know you recommended one pro uh, product here but actually you should have recommended all three uh, and talk less about each one of them right and and there um, our system has some features that allow you to to tune these things we call them ai guidelines uh, but uh, ai guidelines is a kind of kind of some instructions that allow you to um, to really tell the AI how to behave in different situations, but we will be launching more and more of, of these features to really let you understand why a particular message was generated by the AI and to understand what to do so that next time it's exactly as you want. You know, we're not going to say perfect because perfect is very subjective, but let you set it up the way, the way you like it. Mathematics forms the core of data science and machine learning. And now with my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course, you can get a firm grasp of that math, particularly the essential linear algebra and calculus. You can get all the lectures for free on my YouTube channel, but if you don't mind paying a typically small amount for the Udemy version, you get everything from YouTube plus fully worked solutions to exercises and an official course completion certificate. As countless guests on the show have emphasized, to be the best data scientist you can be, you've got to know the underlying math. So check out the links to my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course in the show notes or at johncrone.com slash udemy. That's johncrone.com slash u-d-e-m-y. Sweet. All right. That, uh, you've now given us a clear picture of what the QuitChat product is. And also, it provides us with a kind of a general way of thinking about AI assistants and how we might want to be deploying them into our company. So thank you very much for that. Let's get into some specific challenges with designing conversational assistants now. So when 
I'm using a conversational system with my company, it's critical for me and probably most companies that it's not going to say inappropriate things, unethical things, dangerous things, or just go off brand. What kinds of safety checks or controls do you put in place? What kinds of guardrails do you have to put in to, uh, to try to ensure that these kinds of issues don't take place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the short answer is that that's something that, uh, that we would like our users to not need to worry about. And that's something that we deal, deal with uh, in, internally. Uh, and by that, uh, by that, I mean that the context and what the AI assistant can talk about is very much limited to the specific topics and knowledge bases that have been set up by the, uh, by the user. Um, you know, it's interesting to look back on the sort of history of LLMs, which goes, uh, well, which, uh, goes back many years, but in 2020, obviously when GPT-3 came out, uh, they all started gaining in, in popularity. And it's interesting to see how uh, the topic of safety has has evolved a lot. So with the original GPT-3, um, it was very easy to, um, you know, to make it go uh, off topic, to make it say, say uh, inappropriate things. Um, so in the early days, uh, when we were um, one of the first users of GPT-3, we were uh, talking to, to OpenAI, uh, researchers quite often about how to best uh, create filters and and other solutions to, to guard raise the, the models. Today, that conversation is a bit different because OpenAI has done a lot of work on uh, tuning the models such that they uh, follow instructions very, very closely at that, and that they uh, follow the topic of the conversation very closely as well. But obviously, um, the work that LLM researchers do on guard raise is, is just one uh, area. And then Companies building on top of them, they need to do their own work and embed safe, safety features in their own products to, to make sure that ultimately the end user doesn't need to worry about it. Cool, yeah. And so I guess that's the kind of thing that you guys would uh, at QuickChat, you offer that kind of, uh, these kinds of specific safeguards um, that, are, that are dependent on exactly the kind of situation that your client is in. Yes, yes. So especially with custom projects, there are, you know, there are different uh, considerations depending on the industry, depending on the, on the specific uh, needs of the customer and depending on the, the exact design of the conversation. Um, because if we're talking about custom projects, conversations might not be open-ended, but follow some kind of a rough uh, script. And there, obviously, uh, that requires that the guard rates all are very, very strict as well. All right, and then so earlier in the episode, you were talking about knowledge bases. These seem to be critical. I mean, not seem to be. I know that they are critical in order to have these conversational agents be able to represent a company in a unique way and you know their particular product, their particular processes. Um, and, and this would be internal or, or, in, or external. I mean, we've talked mostly in this episode, the examples have revolved around the external facing agents. But you mentioned right at the onset of this episode that, of course, these could also be used internally to allow uh, employees to be answering problems, uh, uh, solving problems more quickly than uh, they otherwise could, maybe be able to answer questions themselves as opposed to having to get in touch with an internal subject matter expert. Um, so are there particular challenges associated with blending the kind of external general knowledge that an LLM might come with already. So an LLM, um, you know, you, you could be taking an off the shelf one like GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 Turbo or Anthropics Claude or whatever. Uh, but then you need to blend that with these knowledge bases. Are there any particular challenges associated with that? Yes, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. And I think we need to distinguish here between AI assistants that are supposed to flexibly handle and answer questions based on some knowledge base that you uh, give it. And we already talked about how the knowledge base needs to be you know, sufficiently clean and, and available in, a, in the right format and so on. And AI assistants that are closer to ChatGPT that cannot fully be trusted, but are a bit more flexible and, and help you with a wider variety of things. And, and actually there, the, the difference and the balance is very, uh, is very subtle. And I think now big companies are starting to, um, to notice that, that it's not as simple as 
give ChatGPT to all uh, employees and l- let it use it because we know that there are some some limitations. But also, it's not as simple as you know uh, set the uh, temperature to zero, use the knowledge base because then we've just built search pretty much, right? So I think if a company is implementing an AI assistant, what needs to go along with that is tools and processes that allow you to be fully aware of of the fact that the AI assistant is one thing, but it's also a tool that helps you clean up your knowledge base and answer questions like, you know, is my knowledge base even capable of giving me that answer? You know, uh, LLMs tend to give you answers that sound very plausible and are very much, um, sound very likely to be correct. But, you know, what if within your knowledge base, there are two potential correct answers to the same questions and the LLM always just give you, gives you one, right? That's, that's not really the, the optimal result, right? But what you should want to be able to do is to see that, that actually there are two possible answers or maybe three or maybe two of them are conflicting. And this answer is actually a, a task for someone to figure out what's, what's going on there and try to talk to the right people to find the uh, loopholes in the, in the knowledge base. So I think, uh, I think the devil is sort of in the details here, right? There's no sort of one AI assistant that will solve all the problems, but, but introducing a, an AI assistant needs to go hand in hand with introducing processes around data cleanup, around analyzing conversations uh, to make sure that the quality of the assistant goes up over time, but also of the knowledge base itself. And I think that's really how, what's going to empower companies and, and let them use AI really efficiently over time. Nice. Yeah. Okay. That was a really concrete example. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, so yeah, so if, yeah, if we're fine tuning, uh, a model on some knowledge base, um, because of things like conflicting information or because of, uh, disambiguity, um, you know, or sorry, <laughs> because of ambiguity, because of potential, um, multiple different good answers to a, a given question, it's the kinds of tools that you build that allows you as a human to debug. We talked about this earlier. So we were, you know, earlier we were talking about, you know, kind of modules that a conversation designer would use uh, with the quick chat tool. And so there's things like knowledge bases, tone of voice, and then you specifically went into tools for debugging conversations. And so this sounds like a perfect example of that where, uh, yeah, you have the conversation designer being able to um, adjudicate what the best kind of answer is and fine tune these conversations to make them better you mentioned in your response this term temperature, which is something that I'm familiar with, but maybe not all of our listeners are. Would you mind digging into that a bit more? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, basically temperature is a parameter that you use when uh, asking a, uh, an, a large language model to generate text for you. And then if you set, um, set the temperature to a high value, then that means that if you... Um, generate the generate with the same prompt several times, you will get widely different results, right? Um, some of them are generally less, uh, less plausible, uh, but they will be wide, wide variety. Whereas with temperature zero, if you generate, uh, with the same prompt several times, you're very likely to get uh, like almost identical results, right? So, so this is the sort of usual trade-off, you know, low temperature, um, gives you an answers that are very predictable, but are not very creative, might be repetitive, but it's generally more safe, right? It's more likely to be just quoting directly from, from the knowledge base. Uh, whereas with higher, uh, higher temperature, that's what you want to use for the LLM to, you know, write stories for you or write some fantastical uh, scenarios. And I think that's what people use for, um, creating these amazing demos because then you can generate, you know, 50, uh, completely diverse results, choose the, the absolute best one. And that's, then that's really, really impressive. Nice. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, very clarifying. Uh, it was a perfect <laughs> definition of temperature. <laughs> I have nothing else to add to that. Um, so yeah, clearly you have a huge amount of experience with, um, using LLMs, whether they are, um, developed by another company or, or yourselves. Um, let's dig into how quickly this LLM landscape has been changing in recent years. So when you started off with building these kinds of quick chat solutions, what was the ecosystem like then? What were the LLMs like that you were leveraging for, uh, your platform? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I remember uh, vividly, uh, you know, the summer of 2020 when, um, somehow through 
uh, Twitter, um, some Y Combinator connections, I first heard about uh, GPT-3. So this new model that came out and there was a, you know, a very closed uh, beta and uh, you need to be very quick to be able to, to sign up and get access to the model. And, and somehow I managed to be one of the uh, first people to get access. And I remember there was this there was this very, very novel sort of idea. I mean, you know, we've had GPT-2 before, uh, but, but the gap between GPT-2 and GPT-3 was so huge that it was just like yeah. a completely paradigm shift, like completely sure. different experience, sure. right? So you could say that the idea of giving a model some text and having it continue uh, was like a brand new idea. And I remember when I uh, first started playing around with GPT-3, um, like for me, it was, it was completely amazing. And I was hundred percent sure that like, this is going to like change the tech world over the next few years. Um, obviously, uh, in the very early days, our idea to build AI assistance was a bit, um, controversial, I would say, uh, simply because the models weren't, uh, performing, uh, as well as they are today. They were slow and very expensive. Um, so, uh, I remember, um, when we were doing some first customer demos back in 2020, um, we knew that now we're talking about something like, I don't know, short conversation might cost a dollar, right? It's, it's, it's completely unfeasible. Um, but we kind of had this big bag bet that, um, there will be huge advances in the models themselves. There'll be a huge competition and the prices will just go down. Uh, which is exactly what we see. And if we compare, you know, GPT 3.5 turbo, turbo in terms of how cheap and how fast it is, it's it's absolutely amazing what the progress has been. Um, and this idea of creating AI assistants that can, you know, use several several calls to several LMs um, uh, to generate one response, this idea became, you know, very much plausible and very much uh, within budgets of, of typical projects. Um, so, so a lot has changed. Obviously, uh, the whole tech world sort of shifted towards generative AI solutions, which, um, you know, which, which kind of, uh, caused the usual thing where now every problem is being solved with, with generative AI. So, um, actually I, I feel like these days we have very few startups that, okay, maybe not very few, but, but, um, uh, it's, it's not as common to start with a, with a problem. Um, but they usually start with. I want to use GPT-4 and now let me find a problem that I can solve with that. Um, that's, that's obviously very, very typical, but it leads to, to many, um, you know, interesting situations like, for example, something I mentioned before, which is the focus on, uh, the most flashy demo, the, um, the product that's easiest to, to set up, to start with, but, uh, there's much less, um, attention paid to what happens in the long run. How do they let businesses optimize for the years to come, how do I make sure that my solution is is viable over you know thousands of of interactions and so on? But that's you know that's that's always been like that with with new exciting technology. Yeah, you mentioned there in the beginning uh, when you got access to GPT three for the first time in 2020 that it was expensive and it was slow. But one other thing that you, that I think was a huge issue until GPT four was released uh, in early 2023. Uh, was hallucinations. They were a big problem before, right? That That is true. Uh, I mean, we internally have been working on a, on a number of uh, solutions to, to try to remedy that. So I think if you're using, if you're interacting with LLMs via a platform like QuickChat, you felt that hallucinations have been sort of less of a problem over time. Um, yeah, but it is true that if you're using uh, models just like that, then, then obviously you can tell that that's been a huge focus um, uh, within the OpenAI team and and other competitors, um, and yeah, so so models become uh, more and more usable um, in a sort of vanilla uh, vanilla way, right? That, for example, ChatGPT you can use as is, and uh, you know millions of people use it, find it extremely useful. So that's yeah, so that's, that's obviously hats off to the OpenAI team in general and the ML community. Mathematics forms the core of data science and machine learning. And now with my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course, you can get a firm grasp of that math, particularly the essential linear algebra and calculus. You can get all the lectures for free on my YouTube channel, but if you don't mind paying a typically small amount for the Udemy version, you get everything from YouTube plus 
fully worked solutions to exercises, and an official course completion certificate. As countless guests on the show have emphasized, to be the best data scientist you can be, you've got to know the underlying math. So check out the links to my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course in the show notes or at johncrone.com slash udemy. That's johncrone.com slash u-d-e-m-y. Yeah, it's been night and day. It kind of, it, it's amazing how often, you know, maybe once a week when I post on LinkedIn, some amazing new generative AI capability, um, it could be something that my company is rolling out for our customers, or it could be, you know, some complete innovation from somewhere from, from a third party. And about once a week, somebody will write, ah, this will never take off because of hallucinations. They're an issue. Like, how can we deploy these systems? And I'm like, have you been using GPT-4? Because like, I've been using GPT-4 since March, since it came out. And I cannot think of one instance where I had an issue with hallucination, where I mm -hmm. note, where I was able to notice uh, some problem. And so it's amazing how, I, I guess this is just probably what humans have always been like, that like some new technology comes along and people dig their heels in and are like, for reason X, this is never going to be an effective solution. And it seems like hallucinations are the thing that that pops up most that I see uh, with generative AI. And it, yeah, obviously these people have not been using the modern tools. And it's cool to know that with um, interfaces like QuickChat over top of even GPT three years ago, you were able to minimize hallucinations. I don't know to what extent you can go into describing how you prevent hallucinations from happening. So, uh, you know, my experience with GPT-3, particularly around kind of like 2021, um, was that it did make a, a lot of hallucinations that, that was commonplace um, for me. Um, so how does QuickChat identify that a hallucination might be there and prevent it from surfacing to a user? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but, uh, but the very basic idea is, again, that... Um, we don't trust the model as much. We treat the model as a tool for generating text. Now, if you think about it, right. uh, we focus a whole lot on how do we construct and format the context that we give to the model, right? So we really want to have tight control over what the model sort of reads before the... Uh, and here I'm talking about the in-context in learning. I'm not talking about um, fine-tuning. So we have very tight control over what the, what the model reads just before uh, generation. Uh, the, and then obviously there are post-processing steps that you can take, right? So you can ask yourself questions like, all right, here I gave the model this, this kind of information and this is what the model said. Can I use LLMs again in some smart way to try and predict or evaluate how likely it is that this thing here is, um, is made up or incorrect, right? Um, maybe we're looking at a use case where... Uh, using outside knowledge is uh, dangerous 100% uh, of the time. Maybe all I want is for the model to be, you know, s rephrasing in a smart way the very context that I was able to find for it in the in the knowledge base. And then I can, in my processing post-processing step, I can make just 100% sure that what I see here in the response um, comes out directly from what was given in the in the context. And there are, there are several different pre and post processing steps that you can take to just uh, eliminate the, the risk. Nice. That was a great answer. Uh, that makes sense to me. And uh, I appreciate you going into some detail there without uh, divulging too much of your proprietary secret sauce there. So uh, again, this might be something that kind of touches on proprietary secret sauce, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so years ago, you were using the OpenAI APIs. Uh, do you still leverage OpenAI APIs today um, underneath QuickChat? Uh, yes, uh, we use OpenAI and other vendors as well, but I think at least at this point, it's still safe to say that OpenAI is uh, is the best vendor. Um, but it is true that uh, you know with, to work in order to work with businesses, you have to be able to switch between dif different vendors to be able to um, adjust to particular customer needs, to be able to handle potential outages. Um, so obviously we are, we're watching the entire landscape very, very closely and QuickChat is, is integrated with, with several different vendors. Uh, obviously new models keep coming out almost, almost every day. So you need to really be, be on top of things to know which, which one is, is, is the best, uh, for different tasks currently. 
Nice. Are you able to recommend other particular vendors to our listeners and the circumstances when they might be useful? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just in very general terms, you know, the usual suspects. Uh, so uh, Cohere, um, uh, Anthropic, um, uh, some of the new Llama models as well. So uh, I, I highly recommend uh, all, all companies to do their own research and to really find what works best in their um, uh, in their particular use case, because obviously the number of parameters is just one superficial metric, but what really matters is your use case, uh, how big of a problem is latency, how big of a problem is potential uh, downtimes, and how well the model is tuned to your particular issue. Maybe you need to uh, do your own fine tuning. Maybe you need um, to work with someone else to build a data set for your fine tuning task. Um, so yeah, just do your own research. That's what I would recommend. Very cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Those are definitely the usual suspects. <laughs> uh, OpenAI, Cohere, Anthropic for sure. And yeah, cool to hear that sometimes uh, the Llama 2 family comes in handy as well. That's typically what uh, we use in my company is Llama 2 um, for fine tuning um, for specific tasks. And yeah, it makes perfect sense to be worried about downtime being a big factor and being able to swap if necessary. Um, there was an instance at the time of recording uh, this episode a couple of weeks ago, OpenAI had a huge outage, um, and it's rare. Like you can, you can look and you can see they have a downtime page where you can see for their various services, you know, was there downtime on a given day over the past year kind of thing. And it's green almost all the time, but like that day it was red. And that, mm -hmm. if, if you are using just one vendor, um, you are critically stuck to them. Now, multiple of those vendors <laughs> could be behind the scenes relying on, say, one big cloud provider like AWS. And then Absolutely. It, AWS. But typically, you know, huge companies um, like OpenAI, Cohere, Anthropic, they should be, I don't actually know the details on this, but they should be, uh, you know, if they are relying on third party data centers, then they should be relying on them in multiple different regions. And, um, so, so hopefully that kind of outage uh, would be rare across multiple of mm -hmm. these vendors. Um, very cool. Uh, those are super interesting insights. Um, uh, speaking of instability, <laughs> mm -hmm. do you think that, um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I try not to be like just the buzzy news sure, show. I sure. want most of what we cover to be kind of like long-term knowledge that... <laughs> Um, that are that are you know people could could t probably with most super data science episodes come back years later and all still be relevant information. But that caveat aside, <laughs> um, recently everyone is aware of the turmoil between OpenAI's board and its CEO. Do you, do things like that happening do, when you're watching that happen as somebody who's really dependent on OpenAI services? Do you, does that make you think oh? You know, you you already have you know backup vendors lined up like Anthropic and Cohere. So maybe mm -hmm. for you, it's not something that you're like, oh man, is, do we need to think about switching? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. You probably, you probably get where I'm going with this question. That's a good question. Obviously, when um, when all of the some outman situation was happening over the weekend, we were watching it closely. I never thought uh, seriously that this might result in some kind of downtime or, or or full outage of open AI. I didn't really see a connection there. I think it was more. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't. So yeah, I don't mean like it to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't expect that either. But I mean, kind of like longer term as a partner stability, uh -huh. as opposed to like, um, you know, within a given day downtime, I, I wouldn't be worried about that either. But just mm -hmm. like in terms of, you know, the reliability of a partner, um, if, if that, yeah, yeah, I guess that's kind of where my question was going. Got it. Yeah. So so in that case, yeah, I guess it is an impulse that will like motivate you slightly more to do your homework around other vendors and your own reliability. I don't think it's going to change over time. Uh, but I think today, most uh, companies like ours are way more prepared for a potential outage at OpenAI than they were, uh, you know, a long time ago, right? Because this um, it's, it's just been more sort of discussed and on the news and there are, there are more alternatives as well. Um, but I'm sure that the whole OpenAI team is very much aware of that. Um, 
and they're aware that um, you know we're all having these dis- discussions. And I think their number one consideration over those those few days was how to make sure that that the users, the companies that rely on OpenAI, that don't they don't get get affected. Uh, and, and I think in that sense they handled it very well. Yeah, yeah. I guess that answers everything that I was anticipating. Um, all right, so beyond uh, immediate um, politics happening inside some of these big companies, um, what do you see happening in the next few years? So for me, GPT-4 was a huge game changer. That release in March of 2023, it absolutely blew my mind. And I went from being somebody who was skeptical, isn't the right word, because obviously I work in AI and been a data scientist for a long time, and I know that there's a huge amount of potential here. I've always known that things like an artificial general intelligence, for lack of a better term, uh, would are, are theoretically possible. But even with GPT-3, for me, I thought, yeah, okay, GPT-3, very useful tool, but it didn't blow my mind like GPT-4 did. So obviously, there's these kinds of things where you know scaling up by another factor of 10 or 100 with... I don't know, some hypothetical GPT-5 or GPT-6. Um, I think that there's going to be, uh, I, I, it seems like scaling up is going to continue to yield pretty mind-blowing dividends uh, in terms of the abstractions um, that these models can anticipate and, and the reasoning that they can handle. We also have had in recent weeks things like this Q-Star rumor um, as being this kind of system that is able to, uh, to, to perform uh, math highly accurately in a way that suggests that the problem solving capabilities of AI systems are about to, to make a giant leap forward. So yeah, so I just, I'm curious what insights you have as somebody who's deeply embedded in the generative AI space uh, as to what kinds of changes we might anticipate in the coming years. Yes, yeah, so uh, one, th- one trend I think is, is only going to strengthen is the sort of work that companies like like QuickChat do, which is to take these models like GPT-3, GPT-4 that are performing very well already and bring them into production, business, real problem solving. So uh, what I mean uh, by that is so that people at home and people in offices will be able to talk to computers and reliably achieve tasks uh, using that. You know, it's... I think the, the the technology is very ready uh, for websites turning from you know us clicking at buttons to us talking to an avatar or talking to to a website and just completing tasks using voice. I think that the technology is very much there. Um, what is needed is is a lot of work on on implementation, on understanding the needs of businesses, and a lot of that work is going to co- continue and generate a lot of value. Because productivity productivity will increase uh, greatly, and uh, and I basically don't see a future where in five years we don't talk to our computers. Uh, so that's for sure. Um, but there will be a lot of people who are interested in pushing AI um, more towards the, the the autonomy or what we what we think what we think about in terms of you know potential dangers of of AI. Um, I don't think um, walking in the direction um, in the direction of GPT three, four, five without any substantial changes will uh, lead to any any leaps. I think uh, some breakthroughs will be needed, and I think you um, what you alluded to, so Q stars, so any ideas around um, uh, reinforcement learning style uh, ideas. I think those those will need to be introduced to really push the frontiers. And um, and that's where things get get really interested, I- interesting because uh, I really think that the real challenge is to make these models that are extremely smart within one domain uh, to tr- to be able to work across domains, and um, and that is obviously extremely difficult because the number of different domains that we as humans operate in is is enormous, right? Text is just one of them, and GPT four perhaps m- mastered text. Um, but then even interacting with things of the internet um, is, is, a, is a completely different task to be able to navigate that, to be able to learn uh, there, to be able to 
generate enough training data with reasonable tasks to be able to, to go through, you know, billions and billions of examples and really um, generate understanding. Um, another, another thought I had was that um, to really be able to navigate the real world, uh, the models need to sort of become much, much better at, um, at the sort of tail uh, events or the sort of more uh, black swan events. I think the models are too much uh, focused on sort of the, the, the average case, whereas really um, stand out and fulfill amazing tasks in the real world. You need to navigate those, uh, you know, one in a million uh, situations really, really well, really, really well. And that's something that humans are really good at. Um, most likely because of the wiring in our brains that have been developed over millions of years of, of evolution. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, very much uh, uncertain idea needs to somehow be embedded in the, in this new class of, of models. And I, and I'm sure a lot of smart people are working on exactly that uh, as we speak right now. Yeah. Nice, great answers. And I agree with everything that you said. Um, I do think that things like integrating reinforcement learning are critical uh, to making a big leap forward in these generative AI conversations. Um, and yeah, I agree with your vision that tools like you're offering with QuickChat are going to enable us to have natural language conversations in so many different circumstances in real life, online, for dealing with customer problems it, or, or for just interacting with products. Um, it's, it's so much more natural. And yeah, it can be way faster and, and uh, way more enjoyable. So I do agree with you that that is the future. Um, going back now into your past, <laughs> um, in 2018, you were part of uh, Y Combinator. So you were in the summer 2018 batch. Um, y Combinator is... I think obviously the most well-known startup accelerator on the planet and presumably one of the most competitive to get into. Can you tell us about the experience of that and how it helped you get quick chat AI to where it is today? Sure. So in 2018, um, I was working at uh, Microsoft in London on, uh, in the, in the machine learning team working on, um, uh, NLP related stuff to do with, with, the, to do with email. Uh, but at the same time I got really into the, uh, the back then, uh, blockchain scene, especially with, with Ethereum. I remember I went to a talk by Vitalik Buterin who was talking about Ethereum and it and it got me really, really fascinated. Uh, and, and, and until, until today, I think the, the basic idea behind Bitcoin and that it took us as humanity so long to figure out the double spend problem. I think it's, I think it's really fascinating. And the technology behind blockchain is really fascinating. And, um, and sorry, I, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm a, comp I'm, I really know uh -huh, very uh -huh. minimal about blockchain and Bitcoin. What is the double spend problem? Right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I can still explain it, uh, well enough. Um, so the double spend problem is, is the very basic problem that was stopping people from creating real digital currencies back in the day. And that's the problem that was solved by Satoshi Nakamoto. So someone who we still don't know who, who they are actually. Um, and, um, yeah, and the, and the very basic idea of blockchain is, um, is to be able to solve the, the double spend problem. And, um, in very broad, very, very broad terms, blockchain is a public ledger where, uh, people can contribute what they think are the financial transactions that happen in the world. And anyone can try to append another transaction, which basically says that I know, you sent me $100. And it's perfectly fine for anyone to try and attach a, a, a new transaction, even if it's completely fraudulent, it never happened, or you give me $100 would make your bank account a, a, a minus $50, right? And then uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's idea was to basically make it very expensive in money terms to one, try and lie in the ledger and also try to have other people, try to let other people lie in the ledger, right? So it means that if we are the Bitcoin community, you have some Bitcoins, I have some Bitcoins, and we have a shared uh, motivation to keep 
Bitcoin um, valuable, to, to keep the price of Bitcoin high, right? And the only reason why I would want to prevent you from uh, faking transactions to get rich is that I want to prevent Bitcoin from um, losing credibility and losing its value, right? We might want to collude, but then the majority would always outvote us. And that's the, that's the basic idea, not very well explained, uh, that is keeping Bitcoin you know, afloat until, until t- today. And, that's, uh, and that I think is extremely smart. And then uh, Ethereum took that idea a step further and said that, how about instead of that transaction being someone sending someone else money, we could make that transaction any sort of computation, right? And now we have a world computer where we um, let you, you know, make uh, much more complicated financial transactions because you can essentially run any kind of a program, but that program still has that feature that you cannot run it in a way that evaluates some basic rules because then people will jump on it and make sure that that transaction doesn't go through and you lose your money. That's the, that's the very basic idea. And, and in theory allows a lot of, um, a lot of amazing, uh, sort of global projects to be run like a, I don't know, like a global, um, insurance scheme or, or global, um, bank that is completely independent of, um, well, yeah, completely independent of any, any single entity and just run by, by the, by the democracy, by, by the majority of people. Um, and, uh, and the idea I had, uh, when I applied to Y Combinator was that, uh, people who, uh, create these projects on top of the world computer, uh, the issue they struggle with is that once you kick off your project, you can't, uh, very easily edit the rules that you set up. You can't easily like debug it or, uh, you know, launch new code to, this, to, to the server. It might be impossible to turn it, to turn it back. So you need very strong guard la- guardrails um, ahead of the time, and you need to do a lot of testing to make sure that your solution works as expected. Um, so uh, I was offering a, I created software that that allows you to run uh, simulations of your of the economy that you created to not only test for bugs in your code, but to test that the rules that you set up will make people behave in a way in a way you want, and that's the idea. Um, uh, that, uh, that our company started with, we, uh, I went through my combinator in 2018. Um, uh, but then, you know, we, we had a few, a few pivots, uh, most of them were machine learning related, but, but that's what got us to, to, uh, quick chat in 2020. Very cool. Fascinating. Yeah. It's, it is always interesting for me to learn a bit about Bitcoin because I don't know <laughs> that much. Uh, we did a couple episodes last year. Um, I can quickly dig up the episode numbers in case people are interested. Um, so we did episode number 621 last year, as well as episode number 625. We were we had guests from uh, Chainalysis, which is the world's best known uh, analytics provider for blockchain data. And yeah, so it was kind of so. But even those episodes. We didn't get into the kind very much into the kinds of things that you were describing there, like the double spend mm-hmm. problem. That it's not something that I'd ever heard before, because in those episodes we were primarily concerned with like data analytics and data science applied to the blockchain, um, as opposed to like the genesis of the ideas and the importance of the idea. So, very cool. And yeah, so I don't know if you have kind of general advice as to, you know, if people are thinking about getting into an accelerator, like what are the advantages of going into accelerator or not? If you have a startup idea, I, I definitely recommend Y Combinator. If you, if you can get in, I definitely recommend it because it's, it's just teaches you all that you need to know, uh, to maximize your your chances of, of success. Uh, that said, uh, Y Combinator is also amazing in a way, in a sense that they published all of their wisdom online, basically. Um, I think every startup founder should read 100% of the stuff that Y Combinator published online because it literally tells you step by step how to build your uh, how to build a startup and how to succeed, how to maximize your chances. Obviously, the, the tricky part is that most of these uh, most of the advice is kind of meta advice, so it tells you how to think about problems. It it uh, it explains to you the importance of finding the right co-founder of not giving up, of evaluating your ideas well, of, of, um, 
putting a price tag on a product as fast as possible of, of listening to your users and so on. But these are, these are just meta advice. And obviously what you actually need to do to succeed that you need to figure out uh, on your own because you're the expert on your users. You're the expert on your, on your products. Um, so Y Combinator, I definitely do, do recommend. Um, there are lots of other accelerators that provide excellent, excellent guidance. Um, but it is true that no accelerator is, uh, is a replacement to actually doing the work. Um, in order to create a successful product, you need to be ready for uh, a lot of failures for many years of trying over and over again. And there's no, uh, there's no quick wins. Uh, if something feels like a quick win, then, um, I'm sure you'll find out that it's actually not as simple. Uh, the typical feeling that you get is that you, you've been sort of heads down, focused and working day after day for many, many months. And then suddenly when you stop and maybe take a vacation and look back over the past year, then you see how much you've achieved. But every day feels just like extremely hard work dug into, into details. And, and that's how it should feel. And any other feels like a, any, any, anything else feels like a quick win that is actually um, diverting you from what you, you should be doing to make your product uh, to get it to where it should be. That's great guidance. How do you know when it's the right time to pivot? Like you talked about having this uh, economic simulator for uh, uh -huh. blockchain to start with, and now you're doing conversational AI. Like, uh -huh. how do you know when it's time to be pivoting from one idea to another? That's a very good question. And we pivoted a few times and I'm really not sure if, 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 if we timed it well, uh, to be honest, it's a very difficult, difficult question. What I would say is that uh, I definitely recommend having a co-founder and having someone who is uh, bought into the idea as much as you have so that you can have honest conversations about where you really are, because that's, that's the important thing when you're doing a startup is to um, really think about the objective truth about your current uh, situation. Um, another thing I will mention is that you need to try and monetize your product as quickly as possible because it's extremely dangerous to give away something for free or very, very cheaply and um, have users who tell you a lot of compliments and maybe even use your product, but actually they only use it because it's free or they only use it because you're actually more of a, a consultant than a product company. Um, and all of these things uh, might uh, sort of obstruct your view and make you think think that you're more successful than you actually are. Whereas maybe the truth is that you should have pivoted a few months ago. Um, I also, you know, absolutely recommend <clears throat> whatever you're working on, just keep your eyes wide open. Uh, technology right now is evolving extremely fast and, and startups will always be more, um, nimble and agile than, than big companies and are, uh, and it's much easier for them to spot a new idea create a new solution and, and be first to market before the, the large competitors, um, move there. So, um, yeah, so no easy answer on, on when to pivot, but, but just, um, try to be true to, to what you're looking for, get a co-founder and talk a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are great answers. Yeah. Having a co-founder that keeps you objective. It's a great idea. And then also this idea of getting to pricing and selling as early as possible. I couldn't agree more. That's mm -hmm. great guidance. Um, it, that gives you a real sense of whether you you're uh, whether you have product market fit or not. Awesome. All right. Well, Piotr, this has been a fascinating episode. I have come out of it a lot more knowledgeable than I went into it. Thank you very much. Uh, before I let you go, do you have a book recommendation for us? Oh yes. Uh, I I uh, yeah. It's funny. I was I was talking to. Uh, to the people in my team about this book a lot, and I really recommend it. I, so I'm reading right now a biography of uh, Walt Disney. Um, it's uh, the title is Walt Disney um, American Imagination. Uh, I can't remember the full title. Um, it's not. I wouldn't say it's it's a business book. Uh, it's a it's a biography, but I highly recommend it to all startup founders uh, to really understand what it means to be obsessed about your product. And to be obsessed about just creating something that is the absolute best in the world. You know, it's uh, uh, the description of how much time Walt Disney spent on his early films. Uh, it's, it's so inspiring. I don't think many people uh, match that level of, of dedication. Very, very inspiring. Highly recommend it. 
Very cool. Uh, that is not the kind of the typical <laughs> founder uh, that that we have brought up on the show. So that's a great recommendation, but I totally get it. I mean, absolutely game-changing entrepreneur and really a tech entrepreneur. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's a different kind of tech, no computers around, but to go from drawing things on paper to, you know, creating Snow White uh, in 1937, I think it's, it's absolutely amazing what they, what they created, but it was sheer dedication, hard work, you know, day, day after day for many, many years. Yeah. Wild. And uh, yeah. So if our listeners want to be able to get, continue to extract valuable knowledge from you, from your personal internal knowledge basis, um, how can they do that after the episode? Um, yeah, so the best sources would be just look me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow QuickJet AI and there you can find both me and my co-founder on, on, on social media. We try to share our, our thoughts um, on conversational AI and AI more broadly more and more uh, often. So please do follow our blog and, and QuickJet AI social media. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you so much for taking the time. And yeah, maybe we'll check in again in a few years and see how Quick Chat is coming along. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. It was, it was great talking to you. Cheers. Fantastic how Piotr and his team are making generative AI practical and commercially impactful. In today's episode, Piotr filled us in on how the successful implementation of conversational agents for a business use case requires providing the agent with relevant context from a knowledge base, debugging factual ambiguities that could emerge in conversation, having guardrails in place to avoid harmful conversations, flagging when conversations require a human to be brought into the loop, gathering key insights from all of the AI agents' conversations and reporting on those to the humans running the business, and having redundancy across multiple LLM providers, including perhaps a blend of proprietary APIs like OpenAI, Cohere, and Anthropic, alongside open source models like Llama 3. Separately, Piotr talked about how incorporating reinforcement learning into LLM approaches, such as the QSTAR model that's rumored out of OpenAI, could be the key to making a leap forward in generative AI capabilities. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Piotr's social media profiles, as well as my own, at superdatascience.com slash 743. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another excellent episode for us today for enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you. We're very, very grateful indeed to our sponsors. You can support this show by checking out our sponsors links, which are in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can do that. You can get all the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Otherwise, please share, please review, please subscribe. Let your friends and colleagues know how much you love the Super Data Science Podcast. Uh, but if you don't want to do any of that, that's fine too. Most importantly, I just want you to keep on listening. I'm so grateful to have you listening and I hope I can continue to make episodes you love for years and years to come. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.